Howdy and welcome to Wise About Texas, your award-winning Texas history podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise. Thanks very much for tuning in for some Texas history. I'm going to do something today that I've never done on this podcast. A lot of podcasters do this from time to time. I've never have, but I'm going to do it today for a special reason, and that's cover a subject that I've already covered. Um, There is a method to my madness. 2023 marks a bicentennial in Texas. Now, that's strange because Texas as a republic and as a state is not yet 200 years old. Uh, Texas as a province of New Spain and Mexico really doesn't have a clear-cut beginning that we recognize, so that won't work either. But what is 200 years old? Well, uh, if you go back and check out episode 50, you'll find some of the similar information that I'm going to discuss today. But I'm also going to add some things. I'm going to read from a couple of letters. Uh, and add some perspective and a few additional points about this subject that we're going to focus on as we go through 2023. So what's 200 years old? The iconic Texas Rangers. Now, Texas has many iconic places and symbols and organizations, but none more so than the Texas Rangers. They are now one of the most accomplished, respected, and unique law enforcement organizations in the world. And the Rangers have a fascinating 200-year history. Throughout 2023, around the state, there will be celebrations and commemorations of Texas Ranger history. And that's important because since the organization in one form or another is older than Texas itself, the Rangers have been present, again, in one form or another for many of the major events in Texas history. So let's go back to 1823 and get wise about Texas. All right, first I want to talk about the concept of rangers. Uh, The concept as a military concept has been around for a few hundred years. There was a famous outfit uh, in the French and Indian War in the 1750s called Rogers Rangers, and they were formed because traditional methods of fighting uh, that were used at that time, traditional military tactics, had to be adapted or abandoned depending on the terrain and later the type of enemy you were facing. The Spanish uh, had a similar situation in Texas. Um, recall that Texas, the Spanish tried to settle Texas by populating it uh, using the missions. The idea was that the Franciscan priests would convert the Native Americans to Christianity. But, of course, many of the tribes were hostile, so you had soldiers, and that's the whole mission presidio system that was built. And uh, it was discovered by the Spanish that you couldn't use traditional military tactics on the terrain and to combat the sort of tactics that the Indians engaged in. And since the end of the um, 17th century, really, uh, the Spanish used companies of mounted troops known as flying companies or compañías volantes. And the idea was that they would go out into the field, trail Indians, try to find the hostiles before they were discovered, and basically take the fight to the enemy. And that's the concept of a ranger at that time. When Austin's colony was settled, the Mexican authorities gave Austin instructions on how to do just that, to form these companies. And they were the ones who started using the term Ranger, and of course, it was mostly uh, a descriptor at that time of the function of the unit. You were you were a soldier, and you were either in the infantry, or you were in the cavalry, or you were ranging, or in the ranging corps. Um, and that, of course, would work a lot better. And then, as as uh, and it was one of the great Texas Rangers, Jack Hayes, who further modified the fighting tactics uh, of the of the. Uh, rangers to better match with the Comanche Indians, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's go back to the time when Austin, Austin's colony is starting in Texas. Now, Austin wasn't the only impresario trying to start a colony in Texas, but he's one that we consider the father of Texas. So we'll focus a little bit on him because he sent a very famous letter that gives us this bicentennial. 
Austin uh, would eventually settle about 1,200 families in Texas, but it wasn't easy. And uh, we need to talk a little bit about what Austin found when he got to this place that Spain and later, later Mexico had failed to populate. Um, in March of 1822, Austin wrote a letter to his brother James. Now, Austin was near uh, the town of Laredo at this time. Austin relays an incident where uh, what he recalls as 50 Comanches approached Austin, and he had three guys uh, with him uh, around the Nueces River. Um, Austin was alone in camp when he encountered the Comanches. The Indians had captured the other two men with their horses, and Austin claims to have, quote, expostulated, close quote, the Indians. Uh, here's what Austin wrote, quote, I then expostulated with them for treating their friends, the Americans, in such a manner. When they found there were no Spaniards with me, they gave us back our saddlebags, saddles, and everything else except four blankets, a bridle, my grammar, which means a Spanish dictionary, and several other little things, and all our provisions. Nothing saved our lives but being Americans. Close quote. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about that. One, that they took his Spanish dictionary. Now, uh, there are several accounts through the years of Comanche stealing books because now it wasn't for reading. What they would do is they would take the paper, the pages, and stuff them into their shields between layers of leather, which made the shield uh, harder to penetrate. Another interesting thing is that the Indians took all the food, um, figuring that uh, life's hard on the prairie. Um, Austin decided not to chance such an encounter again because the next group might not be so polite to Americans. And isn't it interesting that it was the uh, Spaniards slash Mexicans the Comanche were against, and Austin's concept was that since they were American, they were spared. That, of course, would later change. Um, Austin's mother, the word got back to Missouri because Austin's mother wrote him uh, in 1822 asking about the Indians because she had heard that Austin's colony had been attacked. She didn't necessarily, by the way, that letter says from Austin's mother says that she didn't necessarily believe the story was true because it had not been in the newspaper, <laughs> which is funny as opposed to today where if it is in the newspaper, you probably can't believe it. In May 1822, uh, there's a letter from Austin to Anastasio Bustamante, who at that time was the captain general of the internal provinces of Mexico, which meant he was the one dealing with Stephen F. Austin. Um, Austin writes to him to discuss Indian attacks on Austin and his, and his settlers, and Austin's of the opinion that one of the reasons the Indians are upset is because of what he calls the Revolution of 1812. Now, what he was, remar uh, what he was referring to was the Gutierrez-McGee expedition, which was a failed attempt by some uh, Mexicans and some Americans to overthrow the Mexican government in Texas. And after that war, um, many of the revolutionaries had settled in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and started trading horses with the Comanches. Austin contended that that trade encouraged depredation on the native Spaniards to supply what he thought were rogue Americans with horses. And he had an idea to stop it. He contended that two of the three routes could be shut down by the military and uh, the trading prevented. And then he suggests uh, that he could invoke the United States and its laws against trading with nations that are at war with allies of the United States to shut down the trade that the horse trade that was going north uh, up the Kansas River to the Missouri River. Austin's theory was that, uh, or his argument was that the U.S. and Mexico were allies, so that it, by trading with the Comanches, the American citizens are fitting out the Comanches to make war on a U.S. ally. Now, Austin made a legal mistake in that reasoning, but what it really does is show uh, that he didn't fully understand uh, the Comanche tribe as a nation. And the Comanches were not one single nation. They were a series of autonomous bands. And uh, we'll get into that in another episode. And we never really would figure that out uh, until toward the end of the Indian Wars. Um, Austin also uh, argued that the Comanches should be provided with an avenue to receive goods. So this is one of the first times that you see uh, the need to supply the Indians to some degree to try to quell the hostilities. And his argument was they would continue to steal horses if we didn't find a way to do some uh, 
trade with him in some way. But his other reason for that was, uh, or the other suggestion that he had was, hey, why don't you uh, just let me, Stephen F. Austin, settle a few more people in Texas. Aha. So now we see uh, some of the method beyond his madness. Um, Austin thought that a well-regulated trading system would pacify the Comanches, but he also mentioned that uh, he would be strengthening his own rifle companies in case the peace plan didn't work. So Austin, as many through the years would, uh, had a lot to learn about the Comanches. Um, A year later, May 1823, uh, Austin had a question for Felipe de la Garza, who was the Mexican military commander in Texas. Austin asked him, quote, whether I can or cannot make war against the hostile Indians and to what extent, close quote. So obviously his ideas for peace were not working very well. Later in 1823, and this is the most important letter, this is a very famous letter to the colonists that Austin wrote in August 1823. In this letter he writes, quote, I have determined to augment at my own private expense the company of men which was raised by order of the late Governor Tres Palacios for the defense of the colony against hostile Indians. I therefore by these presents give public notice that I will employ ten men in addition to those employed by the government to act as rangers for the common defense. Close quote. And with that, the Texas Rangers were born. But wait, what about the folks fighting up until then? Weren't they ranging as we described? Well, they were. But it's this August letter that is considered the first time uh, that the word ranger was used in such a specific context and as a proper noun. So many use this August 1823 date, including the rangers themselves, as the official beginning of the Texas Rangers. And so 200 years later in 2023, we come to the bicentennial. All right, I want to talk about one more thing in connection with the origins of the Rangers. There's more to to say about kind of some early aspects of their service, so I encourage you to go back to episode 50. I'm not going to repeat all that here because what I want to do is I want to set up one of the sub-themes that I uh, want you to think about and, and read about and consider during this bicentennial year, and that is the evolution of the Rangers. In other words, what is a Texas Ranger? I mentioned earlier that the the term really was descriptive as far as their function. Um, and even though Austin started to use it um, as a proper name in that August letter, I want to talk, when we talk about the Rangers today, of course, we're talking about the division of the Texas Department of Public Safety. And they are um, a very accomplished and incredible law enforcement organization, but it hasn't always been that way. And as Texas has evolved, As the law has evolved, as the way you enforce the law has evolved, so have the Texas Rangers. And that's something that's very, very interesting to consider as you see the Rangers making appearances in the various aspects of Texas history. So I want to read from some old documents that uh, show us how the term Ranger was used. The first one is a letter from Francis W. Johnson to Stephen F. Austin, March 21st, 1831. So this is uh, during kind of the heyday of Austin's colony. uh, And Johnson is, uh, one of the things he does in this letter is congratulate Austin uh, and say, I do sincerely wish he may succeed in the circuit court and jury system. So this was a time when Austin was empowered by the Mexican authorities to set up a court system and to set his own laws for the colony. So one of the things Johnson wants, and he's writing from San Felipe, uh, which he refers to as the town of Austin. It was called San Felipe de Austin. He says this, quote, and the first is a memorial to the government. This is a request praying for authority to raise a company of rangers and to make an appropriation for the payment of said rangers, which will be forwarded to the chief of department by this mail. So this is 1831. Johnson wants the authority from Austin to raise a company of rangers for the defense of the of Austin's colony. So that is a traditional military uh, invocation of the term ranger. Next, I want to go to February 1836. So this is the time we haven't yet declared independence, but the uh, provisional government, the general council is meeting, 
and the provisional government's about to start meeting. Uh, This is February 1836, a letter written from Washington on the Brazos. This letter is from two gentlemen, Alexander Thompson and G.A. Patillo, and it's written to Acting Governor J.W. Robinson. They request as follows, quote, the advisory committee appointed to act in the absence of a quorum, and that's the the wreck that was the general council, being informed that a company of rangers commanded by Captain Tumlinson, he's referring to John Tumlinson Jr., are ready for service and also been informed that a large force of the enemy are now at Behar, would therefore advise your excellency that you issue your order to Captain Tumlinson to immediately proceed to Behar to aid the army there, and that the militia that are above San Antonio, the San Antonio Road in the municipality of Mina, which is now Bastrop, be ordered to guard the frontier from Indian depredation and signify the same to Major Williamson. All right, so here you have a request that a ranger company be sent as a military unit to Behar to assist the army and that the militia guard the frontier in the meantime. Um, the Major Williamson that he refers to as Robert McAlpin Williamson, nicknamed Three-Legged Willie because of his wooden leg, and he uh, is listed in other uh, documents around the Revolution as the commander of the ranging corps. So what you can see is that the term ranger is used rather loosely. In fact, there's a document, uh, March 10th, 18. 36, which is a document, uh, now March 10th is right in the middle of the convention where the provisional government was elected at Washington on the Brazos. We have March 2nd, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution drafted and signed March 16th and 17th. So this is March 10th. The Alamo fell four days before. A word is going to reach uh, Washington on the Brazos, if I'm not mistaken, on March 11th. can't remember exactly. And, um, So this document was created as the government was trying to organize, and it's a list of army officers of the regular army appointed by the general council. For example, the colonel is Edward Burleson, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Millard, Major William Oldham. Well, down um, in the various descriptions of the various units, there is the ranging corps is what it's referred to with Robert McAlpin Williamson as the major, three captains, John Tumlinson, William Worthington, and J.W. Barton, three lieutenants, and three second lieutenants. So the ranging corps was considered a subset of the regular military. Now, once the revolution was over, we still had the frontier to defend, and we often think of the Texas Rangers as being those defenders, which they were. Here's a document from Sam Houston. Sam Houston wrote this on May 31st, 1837 at the Capitol, which of course was the city of Houston. And this is uh, written from the executive department to the Texas Senate. Quote, gentlemen of the Senate, I have the pleasure of presenting to you the accompanying nomination for officers, which are to compose the regiment of mounted gunmen for the defense of the frontier and respectfully request your concurrence in the same as I am extremely anxious that the Corps should be speedily organized and rendered efficient. So there, Sam Houston was forming a company of rangers, although he described them as a regiment of mounted gunmen. Uh, So you can see what the frontier required just by the descriptor used. Those would be people, um, that regiment would be performing a function that we traditionally assign to the Texas Rangers, although... That term was not used in that particular document. One last document that I thought was interesting since we're talking about terminology, also written by Sam Houston, and this one's written January 30th, 1838, to John Moody. Um, Major Moody, quote, The president highly approves your suggestion in relation to administrators and desires that they should be observed by your department. Let the oath be so amended in relation to rangers and mounted men as to embrace the fact of their not being mounted for any part of the time which required them to be mounted. Let them only be paid for the time which they were actually mounted as cavalry and the residue as infantry. And so here, uh, now of course you're going to be paid more if you have a horse to take care of uh, as a cavalryman or a ranger, uh, but they weren't always 
uh, mounted. They, I suppose, would lose their horse or didn't have a horse or whatever the problem was. And so um, Houston wanted to make sure that they were only going to get paid as cavalrymen if they were uh, mounted. So that's the use of the term ranger. Houston capitalizes it uh, as a specific force contemplated more uh, to be cavalry for obvious reasons. So those are a few uh, different ways that the term ranger was used in the very earliest part of Texas. And uh, the purpose of, of highlighting that is to get you to think about the function of a ranger and how that has changed throughout Texas history. Because as we talk about the rangers this year, and as you hopefully participate in some of the commemorations around the state and maybe even read uh, some on the rangers, you will see uh, their evolution along with the evolution of Texas and the evolution of law enforcement and not just Texas, but along a frontier, along a border, and within the United States. Another idea to consider is uh, proactive versus reactive. Rain, um, a military is supposed to be proactive. Law enforcement is designed to be reactive. And uh, that's a concept I want you to also think about as we talk about the Texas Rangers in 2023. As I mentioned um, earlier, the Texas Rangers as a law enforcement organization use 1823 as the date of their beginning. So that's what we're going to use here on Wise of Pop Texas. And we're going to have lots of different episodes this year uh, to commemorate uh, the Texas Rangers. We're going to talk a lot about their history. We're going to talk about various important uh, events in the history of the Rangers, and it's my uh, desire, hope, and expectation that we'll have uh, more than one interview with some modern Texas Rangers. Upcoming soon will be a bonus episode with the chairman of the Texas Rangers Bicentennial 2023, so I can give you all a preview of what's going to go on around the state. There will be something in your area to attend, no doubt. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. Like and share the Facebook page. And if you get a minute, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That helps other people discover the show and uh, helps us with uh, search results. If you want to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history, go to patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas. I want you to go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.